Welcome to the Thoughtful Software Podcast, where we discuss emerging technology, interview industry experts, and discuss how to build really great software. Are things changing for better or for worse in the gig and freelance economy? On this episode, we're diving into that conversation with Matt Matola, discussing the human cloud, major pain points for corporations and freelancers, and what we might expect in the years ahead. Matt previously built the Microsoft Freelance Toolkit and is currently a founder in residence at SG7. He is an international keynote speaker, the author of Start Up, Not Start Down, and the upcoming book, The Human Cloud, How Today's Changemakers Use Artificial Intelligence and the Human Cloud to Transform Work. Here's Andrew, Matt, and Fahad. Hey, Matt. Welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Cool. So we're going to talk today about the gig economy, um, you know, kind of what's happened in the last few years and, you know, what we're seeing moving forward. Um, and it, things are definitely changing for better or worse. And so today we're going to dive into that. We'll discuss things like the human cloud, uh, major pain points for corporations and freelancers, and, and you know, what we're going to expect ahead. Uh, it'd be great to kind of find out, uh, you know, how did you get into freelancing and, you know, what's driving your passion around this? Awesome. Awesome. So I think <laughs> the kind of big love, love the intro. I think the kind of big insight that you're hitting on right now in terms of what's changed yesterday from yesterday to today into tomorrow is just this word gig. I can't wait till we get rid of it. <laughs> That's going to be my, my little uh, peak of interest for the rest of the conversation is you'll hear why we're probably going to you know, obliterate this word gig and, and talk about people just like we talk about full-time employees. And so there's my little preview. But so how I got into freelance, quite frankly, it was totally by accident. Uh, I was in college and I was a student athlete. And so full-time roles and full-time internships weren't, weren't a thing that I could do. And instead, I just looked to local business owners and asked how could I help in a way that was project-based and not 40 hours a week. And I kind of fell into this market research, budgeting. My major was finance and accounting, so I sort of sold that. And I didn't know it was called freelancing. I just thought I was working. But I realized I was a freelancer when I had to take my first real-time job. And I had to go into the same office every single day for five weeks and stay there for 40 hours a week. And so that was my big experience of, whoa, this thing you did when you were in college and loved was actually pretty different. And so that's when I realized, whoa, okay, I was actually a freelancer and this isn't how everyone works. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, actually, and maybe Andrew can answer this too, or Matt, uh, what is the difference between a freelancer, consultant, and a con? I mean, it seems like we've been doing this for a while. Legally, nothing. <laughs> um, I mean, depending on the state, obviously California just passed their law and uh, who knows what's going to happen there, but I mean, it's 1099 or W2, it's all tax basis. There are some distinctions in laws, depending on the state you're in. Again, um, you know, from Ohio has different laws in California, has different laws in New York, uh, but really it comes down to tax basis, who pays the federal tax um, and who's liable for what. Um, and also worker rights um, is a different too, but from a purely, I guess, from a just an abstract way, it only comes down to legal distinction and tax distinction. Yeah, it's interesting. That, that's an awesome point. I think from a from a customer lens as well as an individual lens, I think the good analysis is the freelancer versus consultant, because the freelance, what's really kind of revolutionary about freelance, the only thing that's different today, is the fact that you can go direct to talent. Meaning, if I go to a consulting agency. I'm hiring the consulting agency and I'm hoping that I get the right individuals in place. Whereas if I'm going through a freelance model, I'm working with that specific individual. Now, if you're the individual, it's kind of this mix of like, okay, now are you an entrepreneur? Sort of what are you? Uh, I like to think it's more you're someone who works by outcomes, meaning you don't work in a way that you just go to an office eight hours a day. You work in a way that says, hey, here's a tangible outcome that I will deliver you. And then likewise, from a customer side, you're not just going to a company, you're going to that specific individual. Mm. So one of the chief issues with the freelance model today, um, and obviously this is going to change and there's networks trying to change it, is vetting, right? If I'm, um, if I sell cars and I now need software because everyone's a software company, um, but I sell cars for a living, I don't necessarily know how to vet a software developer, right? I know how to vet car salesmen. Um, that's what I do. 
And so, you know, I hire consulting agencies because they vet those people for me. And, you know, there are networks out there that are vetting developers. Um, but even then, you know, again, if you're asking me what type of car you want, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. I know that. But if you ask me what kind of software I need, I don't know. Um, the expertise I don't have in-house. So how do you reconcile that? Like, obviously there's, you know, you have different models, you know, the economy isn't gonna be all freelancers or all full-time workers ever. Um, so how do I, as a business owner, pick which is gonna work for me? Yeah, that's a great, great point. So the high level issue that you're hitting on, Andrew, is the fact that a freelance model is subjective. And let's compare this to say an Uber, right? In Uber, the human in the loop, so the actual human who's doing the work, whether it's George or Mary or you name it, the outcome's going to be pretty much the same in terms of they're going to get you from A to B. Now, when we talk about software, whether it's Mary or George or you name it, the outcome's going to be pretty different. Now, let's add a different element to that as well. The customer's perceptions are also, perce uh, are also subjective. What I mean by that is let's say we're getting a PowerPoint done what I like and what you like are totally different and the freelancer can do the same exact thing for both of us, yet we're going to look at it in a different way. And so that's sort of the big issue is the fact that, hey, knowledge work, which software development, marketing, you name it, it's very, very, very subjective. And so there's a couple things we can do to, to sort of mitigate this risk, this outcome risk, because if you're a business owner, the thing you should be hyper, hyper scared of is scope creep. And software, I saw an interesting stat that you all had pulled apart. I think it was something like 68% of software projects go off the rails. Like that's, that's insane, quite frankly. And so as a business owner, what should be top of mind for you is how do I avoid scope creep? Because quite frankly, you can't afford it, whether it's the time lost or the actual cost. But in a freelance model, an interesting way that I've sort of mitigated around that is really, really, really getting deep into the scoping specifically the expectations when it comes to a quality and the way you're going to actually work together. And so when we say quality, generally one of the big problems is if I gave you, let's say you're the business owner, if I gave you a million dollars today and I said, get me a mobile app within a month and you have to hire for it, you probably don't know what to do. You don't know what skills you need. You don't know the actual price you should be paying per user story or sprint or whatever it is. And so one way to mitigate that is to, one, have templates. And so this is where you all are, are phenomenal at, is if you go and you work with you, you know, you're not going to be thrown in the wild, wild west of just this giant marketplace where the customer, for some reason, has the power to say what the price should be and all that. So that's one is just by using templates. A second thing is really trusting in the expert. I think one of the, the biggest sort of... Um, we can call it you know, things that business owners have to understand in this model is you are not the expert. The freelancer is the expert. And so when I'm engaging in freelancers and it's something that's out of my expertise, which quite frankly is like 99% of what I'm hiring for, I simply give the freelancers the scope document and say, this is what I'm looking for. And the very, very specific things that you as a business owner are probably looking for is you want a high level of what exactly what you're going to get. You want some comparables, right? You want one to three examples of what success looks like. And then you probably want a roadmap. You want to understand what's going to get done, when's it going to get done, and who's going to do it. And the important thing of who's going to do it is how do you not get in the way? And so that's just sort of the, the at a high level, what you're really, really worried about at a business owner is you don't want scope creep. You want to have consistent outcomes. And the way to do that is to really, really mitigate these at the expectations at the front. So some of these, you know, for small projects, freelancers are great. Um, 5,000 bucks isn't a lot of risk. I can find a good professional, not likely to fail. It's easily understood. I can probably communicate it. But let's like a, a, a thousand X that, a $5 million, right? Um, I'm not just going to trust some random professional. I can't, right? There's too much risk to my career. There's too much risk to the business. How do we use the freelance uh, model for a project that large? Great question. So let me start by actually kind of um, frame shifting in terms of sometimes the smaller projects are the ones that go completely off the rails. 
what I mean by that is we're actually currently in the middle of a design project uh, for a book and you would be surprised how far people can go with designs or interpretations that are so beyond the scope. Uh, and so that's just a, you know, don't be surprised if all of a sudden a, a hundred dollar design project can turn into this, this massive, this massively complex endeavor. In terms of a $5 million project, I think no matter what the dollar size is or the, the amount of complexity, it really, really, really comes down to being able to scope outcomes and scoping outcomes, scoping small outcomes as soon as possible. Because one really, really big misunderstanding of the freelance model is that you don't build deep relationships because you're not in person. And I would argue that we build deeper relationships because the work first and foremost, and the software enables you to really, really, really laser in on outcomes versus, as we know, some of the political or informal stuff that happens in the office. So that would be what I would be hyper, hyper focused on is how do we chop this up to the smallest possible tangible units so that we can start producing outcomes with that said, what's going to start to happen is you're going to start building these really, 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 really deep relationships with experts, no different than you do in a full-time position. Hey, Matt, let's back up one second, because you seem to know a lot about this topic, and I, can, and, and I can hear that you have a lot of passion around it. And for the last few years, you've been at Microsoft building the freelance toolkit, and now you're working on something new, something probably pretty cool. And which you'll tell us about, uh, why have you devoted so much energy and time into this one topic? Right. It's a, it's a great question. I, it's funny. I did have sort of this, this kind of existential moment uh, early, early in my career when I personally loved freelancing and wanted to, to stay in it. But a lot of my community had sort of been the kind of the, the white, you know, white collar, traditional uh, big four consulting was, was sort of the dream. And so I did have this, this moment where I kind of had to, as, as, you, as you know, Fahad, where we met, where I had to jump to San Francisco and, and live on a couch in the living room to believe that this was the, the path that I should go. But so the reason that I just am so overwhelmingly supportive of freelance and, and really think everyone should have the opportunity is because what I've seen freelance do is create a radical redistrib redistribution of opportunity. What I mean by that is that when I was growing up, I, I always felt like I was looking up and like the doors were all closed. And one specific tangible example of that was when I was an undergrad, I had heard about management consulting, but when I went to the HR portals, my school wasn't on the list. It wasn't on the drop down menu. Meanwhile, in freelance, that didn't happen. Freelance didn't care about where I went to school. All it cared about was the work I did. And then the actual opportunities and the outcomes of my experiences really, really, really created this accelerated opportunity feedback loop. What I mean by that is a two month, say market research or not even a one month market research opportunity then led to a three month business plan build, which led to connecting me to relationships that I could have never, ever predicted. And so there's this awesome bumper sticker that I, that I love on my laptop that says I'm it says, I think it's like two and then it slashes out and says 20 in, in, or no, it says I'm 20 in dog. And then it crosses it out and says gig years. And the reason is because this model just accelerates your ability to create outcomes. Why don't you talk to us about uh, what are you working on today? So I've always focused on building technology that makes freelance effective, efficient, broadly adopted. Uh, what I mean by that, when I say effective, I really mean the best possible outcome. And so let's say, you know, for lack of a better word, a kick-ass mobile app um, in, in, in your case. When we talk about efficient, I always mean faster, higher quality, and more cost-efficient because those are sort of the KPIs that we as an industry like to tag along to. And then broadly adopted, meaning sort of both sides. So freelancer growth, but also the company's spending on freelancers. So most recently, this, this was the Microsoft 365 Freelance Toolkit which really was a solution for enterprises to work with platforms like yourself and scale freelance uh, all across the organization. And so think about it like a jetpack, and it sits on top of your platform and uses existing Microsoft tools 
to enable a enterprise to use you in a way that's compliant, secure, and 100% integrated. Yeah, that's really interesting. <clears throat> why did Microsoft um, kind of adopt this freelance toolkit? And then, you know, why would more organizations uh, want to adopt this? Yeah, that's, so that's an incredible question. I think the way that I like to phrase it is why, why does a company even care about freelance? Because when we think about the alternatives, let's face it, we've been using staffing firms, we've been using consulting agencies, no one's gotten fired for hiring Accenture or some of these main brands. And so why do we even care about freelance? There's two main ones that I've seen. So the first one is to straight up access to talent. Think if you're a large motorcycle manufacturer in the Midwest and you're trying to build a mobile app, you're, you're not going to get the talent that's hanging out in Dolores Park, right, in San Francisco. So you're just not going to have the access to that type of talent. So that's the first one. The second one is the ability to truly be agile. And so it's no secret, startups are able to do what large companies take years, they can do in months. And so for an enterprise to compete with a startup, they need to move. And having static full-time headcount, while it can be great in, in a lot of cases, in terms of agility, it's not ideal. And so they need these flash teams, meaning freelancers that can come in and out. And to use a software example, when you're developing versus when you're supporting, there's a significant difference of the headcount that you need. And so freelance enables the agility for you to do that and sort of have the speed of a startup with the scale of an enterprise. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And you know, you've, you've, been, you've written and spoken a lot about the human cloud. And I find that really interesting. I know it's a buzzword, right? Um, but explain why that's so important like to you know, put, put it together. It's funny today. The human, the, the buzzwords, the human cloud. Who knows what it'll be tomorrow? Uh, I, I like to say I feel like the curmudgeon on top of a on top of a hill, screaming for everyone to just shut up <laughs> because we have more buzzwords than we know what to do with. Um, but when we think about the human cloud, it really is just the office in the cloud, right? We we all we all use Uber to call a taxi. We all use Airbnb or some platform as such whenever we need a place to stay. So the fact that we think work is going to stay in one physical office is quite comical, right? So that's the, that's the quick buzzy word elevator pitch is, well, you probably called this hotel or Airbnb using your phone or, or over the internet. So why in the world do you think your office is going to be different? Uh, one example that's quite funny to me today. So we had pretty huge snowstorm uh, yesterday and today, and a lot of people are working from home. I bet you they're going to get the most work they've done in a while done during the snowstorm. And so yeah. I, we, won't, we won't quote the workers themselves, but I'm willing to bet that some serious work is gonna get done over the next couple of days. Now, when we talk about what is like cutting through this giant buzzword, right? And actually talking about what it is, it's really just the shift from physical and full-time to digital, remote, and outcome-based. When we say digital, think about all the tools that are making this happen, right? It's, it's, it's pretty incredible all the sort of open source applications that we can use for free to get work done. Think about if you have something, if you have a doc and you want to share it with a bunch of people, just fire up G Suite. Or if you have a bunch of tasks that have to get done, hire up Trello. And so that's sort of what's behind this trend in terms of actually making the human cloud operate and be effective and efficient is the fact that there's all these applications making your home office equal, if not better than actually having to go to an office. I think that's really fascinating because one of the things I think that uh, most people struggle with but on both sides, freelancers and corporations, is uh, I think just uh, like Andrew was alluding to earlier was like, you know, scoping the work, but it, you know, and, and managing the project. But for enterprises, that's just a piece of the puzzle, right? Uh, whether, you know, your project might have some freelancers on it, it, it might not. There's just so much of those project management tools. There's, you know, communication tools. If somebody puts that all together and makes it easy for organizations to e even pay freelancers, manage their time, uh, that's probably the first step. Then the next step is, you know, uh, what Andrew was mentioning earlier is right around quality of work. Is this person, you know, the right person? Uh, I know there's companies out there that have figured out how to vet uh, freelancers, uh, but still, uh, it's a difficult thing. By the way, 
AI can't really vet freelancers. Correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew. <laughs> That's not going to happen for a while, is it? Not at all. I mean, AI, think of everything that makes a human being a human being, our creativity, our personality. Yeah, you can measure hard skills, right? I can look at your programming and see how efficient it is. I can look at your output on your marketing slideware and see how effective it is in getting inbound leads. But then the day, it's we're bigger than that, right? I could be the most prolific programmer on the planet and be a complete dick face and no one wants to work with me. And there's a lot of those dudes, right? Smart assholes is the archetype they fall into. No one wants to work with those guys. And so, you know, if you're trying to vet that person, you have to take into account everything. Company culture, you have to take into account um, how they do their work, um, who they work with, personality. Are they, do they move too fast for your organization? Do they move too slow for your organization? You know, will they be a good fit for your, the executive they're working with? Or are they personality fits? I mean, human... Uh, we'll call it people operations because human resources demeans people into resources and people aren't resources, right? It, it's a science, right? Some of the best, you know, there's a reason every Silicon Valley company, every company right now is investing in these chief of staffs and these people operations and all of that. And everyone has one open because it's super hard. But if you get it right, I mean, look at Stripe, look at some of these great startups that are emerging. The reason that they're so successful is because they've hired so well. And they didn't do that because they just said, hey, that dude's talented, get in here. No, they were very meticulous in fitting people into their culture and what they wanted to build, right? And they fit people in there purposely and they knew they'd be a good fit. And AI just simply can't do that. That takes creativity, that takes experience, that takes a data set that doesn't exist. You know, and maybe one day when we when Google finally leaks their database and everyone has access to it, someone will build an HR system that does that. Um, but it, it just it's not possible today for it to happen. Well, Andrew, when you were a freelancer, I mean, you're a developer that's seen it all. What was like the biggest struggle that you faced? I mean, there are three struggles I mainly faced. Um, one was corporate politics. Um, you know, uh, when I was on Teams. Uh, I was helping a major Fortune 500 company build a pretty major product, pretty major innovation. And I was working with Accenture. I was working with Deloitte. And there was a third firm in there too. They were a local firm. And getting them coordinated was nearly impossible because they all had different objectives. Uh, the partner Accenture was trying to get a bigger project and needed this project to be successful. So he was kind of aligned and um, was a good resource. The guy Deloitte didn't care. This was an upsell opportunity that he was handed and didn't want to do. Um, the local guy was friends with the director and would tattle on everybody. Um, and we had to deal with that dynamic. And he was, he was interested in self-preservation. And so getting people aligned as a freelancer and technically while I'm being paid, I'm really a stakeholder. You know, um, I, I personally, my mindset lends it to, to ownership and, um, you know, I just happen to own the things I work on, but it's difficult, right? Especially when you're fighting, you know, the organization has their own agenda, the other teammates have their own agenda. It's hard to get that aligned. I think the second challenge was um, just simply accepting the fact that there are going to be choices made that affect you and you can walk away at any time, right? Um, one of the things that was, uh, again, I, my personality I'm in to the bitter end, like um, when I'm bleeding out on the sidewalk outside, um, that's when I'll quit. Um, and that wasn't necessarily what happened. We, we uh, shipped it successfully, but um, a lot of the guys I work with quit. And so they didn't have buy-in and um, they were like, this is too much work. I'm tired of doing it and they just leave. Um, and the third challenge is just um, organizationally, um, it's just hard because you're an outsider and one um, jealous employees that want to work on the cool project are jealous. And two, um, you know, the manager is never going to quite trust you because, you know, you lose, you lose your job. You just go to the next quote gig. Uh, he loses or she loses her job and they're out a management position. They have to find a new, you know, new position. And so it's like a lot more, yeah, it's that buy and skin in the game. 
you just don't have the same skin in the game as everyone else. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, so like what you're saying, we figured out all the tools, right? Everybody knows how to chat and do project management. Maybe they're not the best tools, but people haven't figured out people, how to manage people yet. Are, is there anyone that's doing it, um, doing this well, Matt or Andrew? So, so I was going to say one thing I'd like to call out behind that as well, though. Uh, so when we talk about automation, artificial intelligence, all those even more, even more buzzwords, but there is a way to curate these subjective preferences. What I mean by that is, like you said, with Stripe and, and some of these startups that are doing an incredible job of hiring, there's a lot of work you can do in the front end to ensure things are going to work in the back end, right? Or when you're actually working. And so I've had these very interesting sort of epiphanies for me in terms of the people I like to work with uh, in regards to how I work with freelancers because of this model and because of the ability to sort of use freelance or, or engage with freelance or find freelancers kind of like that, like the product on Amazon. But so what I mean by that is I've figured out that my sort of sweet spot for some reason is working with people in the Midwest. I, I don't know what it is, but we just seem to get along great. And, and projects, seem, whether it's the informal things or whatever it is, they just seem to really, really roll. And so there's some, so that's one insight that came up. There's others that are very interesting to me where you're able to be very intentional about the way you communicate and you're able to sort of bring that up in the front end before you start working. What I mean by that is I'm super, super asynchronous, meaning if you send me an email at 9 a.m. and I'm already deep in flow, you're probably not going to get an email back until after 5 p.m. If I'm, if I'm working on something strong. And so as it relates to freelances, a lot of times some freelancers will keep asking questions and this happens all the time in full time, right? Someone comes by your office, asks you a question, throws you off a of flow and it ruins your whole day. But so my freelancers and I've been very proactive about it, know that they have to ask me all their questions at once and that I'm super, super asynchronous. So I will say, although, you know, the people aspect is very, very hard, in this freelance model, the ability to curate some of these subjective variables is something that's been incredibly helpful for me and my teams. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you you can curate that, but that's, again, that's humans curating it. No machine can subjectively tell you you only like to be pinged at 11 a.m. Now, I can tell you that I can use Slack's API and say you only respond at 11 a.m., but maybe that's just because you get frustrated with the number of digits next to the slack icon and you eventually just give up and um buy into the uh <laughs> just slack hell that we all go through uh but uh fahad ask your question who's doing the people thing well it's hard staffing agencies have been around forever right uh pretty much don a man i'm sure there's some guy saying hey i have this service and i know someone that can help you and that's technically staffing um uh, even staffing agencies, super experienced, really good, that have great relationships. I know this one guy, he's been staffing for a friend of mine for 22 years, right? That's how long they've been staffing together. And the guy still, he knows everything. He knows the guy's management style. He knows his family. He knows his dog. He knows his, the previous dog he had. Like This guy knows everything about him. And he still has a 50% hit rate. And I just, you know, it's hard. People are hard. If people were easy, we'd all run 5,000 person organizations. We'd all be executives and life would be super good, right? But there's something about it, right? There's something that some people get and some people don't. Communication, understanding, being able to break that all down, it is super hard, right? It's one of the, it's the biggest struggle of my, uh, for me as CEO of Skipless. Like it's difficult because I have to, whenever I communicate something, I have to think about how is this going to look to this group of people and this group of people and this group of people and how's it going to look to this person specifically and really understanding all the variables and personalities and all of that and picking the right choice or the right way of phrasing things and the right way of doing it. And you know, freelancing and picking people is just as difficult. Like if I met, so let's look at disc profiles. You guys heard disc profiles before. Um, there's like four types of personalities. You can go look it up. 
um, and then you need some combination of them. And if you pair enough SCs together, which is like very cautious, rule-oriented people, all right, you don't have any decision makers. No one's dominant. No one's going to drive the conversation. But if you have too many dominant people together, everyone's going to vie for control and driving, and it's going to be too competitive, and you're going to end up with a very bro sales team when you need to be building software. And so it, it's getting that dynamic mix of people, that diversity, that inclusion, that make powerful teams. And you have to get it right. You have to really understand, like, who, what personalities am I hiring? How do they fit in this bigger picture? You know, what kind of personalities do I need? And then finding those personalities. And that, that's a very human thing. And if it was easy, like I said, there'd be one giant staffing monopoly <laughs> that gets it. But instead, there's a lot of small staffing agencies with a couple big ones. But I don't, I've not heard a single person who's, like, really excited about working with Robert Half. And if you do find that person, please send them to me because I'm super excited. But even Robert Half is made up of smaller local-based firms that build relationships with people and really understand how, they're, how they lead and manage. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because even with humans, right, like your personality changes depending on the day of the week, right? I mean, like after four days at CES, you know, my disk profile is not valid anymore. I was, <laughs> I was, I was wrecked at the end of the week. So it's really interesting. But I mean, what, so let's, well, let me ask you this. Um, social media companies claim or i think they know us much better than maybe some of us know ourselves right do you think there's some maybe marriage there of you know uh, what they're doing and uh, you know the work that you might want to do like from the software perspective or you know software development i'll i'll say this if facebook knew how i work they wouldn't invent a facebook at work they would have no need to they know exactly what I was doing at work, how I was working, all my habits. They know my spending habits because they have my Amazon stuff. And they know my browsing habits because they have my Google stuff. And they know my friends' habits because they have like a 15-year-old friend list because I don't use Facebook anymore. Um, they know I have children. They know I'm married. But uh, they don't know how I work. They might know my occupation. But unless they're watching my VS editor or my Word docs, like they don't know who I am at work, right? They just don't. They don't. They might know a little bit about your personality, but again, people have different personas, right? Who you are with your family isn't the same person you present to me, nor should it be, right? If you ever call me like baby or anything like that, Bob, we might fight, right? <laughs> and so, like the person you are with your family, like isn't the same person you're going to be with your friends, isn't the same person you're going to be with the work and it's, it's just it's personas it's not like your Fahad's not this monster who puts on a fake show to everybody but like you know you're nurturing and loving to your children or assumingly you are um and to your wife but you're not nurturing loving to your best friend you're going to pick on them a little bit more you're going to rib them for dumb stuff and that's what we do and then at work you're going to be a bit more of a leader you're going to stand up more be a little bit louder and right and so it's like we're, we're di people are dynamic. That's their nature. That's what makes us great is our adaptability. And so I don't, Facebook knows one part of you. Yeah. So I think you're hitting on the interesting point here is that uh, most people and why people get in trouble with software is they think it's like a menu, right? You can just order a front end and a back end and we're going to calculate it. Like I've seen calculators but software is not like that. It's actually like this piece of art, right? And it requires all these different skills. And I mean, I went to AWS reInvent. I mean, there were a million different cloud vendors there. And I don't know who knows how to put all that stuff together. Maybe you do, Andrew. But it's just a, it's not that simple. And there are like people dynamics more than there are technical dynamics uh, when you're building software. I, I will say one of the most powerful things I learned and this goes back to freelancing. I learned this because I was a freelancer, right? Is selling. Without sales, I would not be a good architect because architecting is selling, right? I have to give you confidence that when I say the words integrate between two systems, you trust that I know what I'm talking about because I can't break it down for you. I had a customer ask me earlier today, describe machine learning to me. I'm thinking, scratching my head. And I'm like, I can't <laughs> describe machine learning to you. Why don't I just describe computers, right? Like, it's such a deep and broad topic that I had to sit there and I stared at my monitor incredulously for like 10 minutes. And then I wrote the paragraph. But that's because I understood the role. 
And like freelancing is powerful because of that, right? It gives us an opportunity to learn to do things that we normally wouldn't do. You know, we learn how to market ourselves a little better, right? Be a little more confident when we pitch something, be a little more salesy, right? Um, and that, that's a powerful skill. Because it's not just knowing how to integrate the systems. A lot of people know how to integrate those systems. Very few people know how to integrate those systems and tell you how to do it in a way that inspires confidence and promotes action. And that, that's marrying sales and technology. And so few people know how to do that, that you'd confuse it as if nobody knew how to do it. And so, you know, those freelancers that can do that, that's why they, they will always have a position in the economy no matter what, because it's a rare skill. It is rarefied to find someone both interested enough to do sales and want to do that and want to be more human and also dig deep enough technically and build the hard skills needed or required to integrate those systems. Yeah, it's and it's it's lucrative too, right? Because you're talking about people that are quite rare and hard to find. I mean, I was talking to a freelancer and he said to get me to work full time, uh, you'd have to give me a million and a half a year. He's like, if you can do that right now, I'll sign with you. <laughs> and you're like, wow, <laughs> all right, this guy must be really, really good. Uh, but it's, just, uh, <laughs> you know, but you know, he's a guy that can put all this together. So maybe I, I, I start questioning a million half a year if he knows <laughs> how to do it. <laughs> I, I think he knows how to sell. Might, I think that's get a true. football team with that. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, what I'm uh, saying, man. <laughs> Could we uh, could we retouch that people processes question? Because I think there's one insight your your uh, customers would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Jump on it. Yeah. So so when we talk about people operations, there there's a, there are a few companies doing some really really interesting things. Specifically, when we talk about remote work, I think that is one of the fundamental paradigm shifts. Is that being fully remote and even like half remote, half half full time or half in person is a pretty, pretty large fundamental change. So when we look at GitLab, when we look at Automatic, the company behind WordPress, there's also some great consultancies like uh, Distribute Consulting as well. But so what's really, really interesting is they're starting to wrap best practices so that remote works better than it would in an office. And one really, really quick example that, that I had that I think really uh, encapsulates this is when we look at feedback, when we look at feedback, like when we look at a corporate setting, there's so much subjective, like these, these inner dynamics of who's supposed to hear what, how much information do I leak, do I seem strong, or all these really informal things. We're in a virtual context, you can mitigate some of this. So what I mean by that is we had this one example where one of our team members uh, wanted feedback on an email they were going to send a customer. Now, this brings up a bunch of questions. Who's supposed to see that feedback? Can everyone see the feedback? Should one person see the feedback? How are you gonna deliver feedback to that? Are you gonna do it in the document? Are you gonna be nice? Are you gonna be mean? Are you gonna be objective? You name it. And so the exact thing that happened was just me from a, from a thread that was including multiple people, just myself received the email saying, hey, I'm looking for feedback on this. But it also uh, affected numerous people on the team and so in a virtual context, I was actually asking one of the, the team members from Automatic what they would do in this case. And her response was, we have very, very clear guidelines on what is performance feedback and what is constructive work output feedback. And if it's constructive work output feedback, it's in the doc for every single person to see. And so that's one example of a company really, really doing it right and being better than they would have in an office because now that feedback, everyone's included, it's objective. And that's a really, really interesting point that I found that I was like, whoa, that's a, that's a game changer in terms of enabling every single company to adopt practices as such. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and probably leads into kind of our final thought. Um, what do you see... What do you what, what like what do you expect from the freelance economy in this next year or over the next five years? Kind of like what do you what do you see coming up ahead? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I think in the next year, what I'm most excited about is we're starting to see people stop calling it freelance and gig, and instead just call it work. And whether it's a team of freelancers, vendors, full time employees, it's really about the expert. Right? You're, not, you're not a freelancer, you're a software developer, or you're a marketer, or you're a designer, or a UX researcher. 
And so I'm so excited and we're starting to see that. And I think over the next year, we're going to really make waves in regards to that. Uh, one, one personal reason is my friends, when I said I freelanced, they, they thought I was an Uber driver. And so I'm just really excited for them to actually understand what I've done and what I do. And so then in the five years, or in five years where I'm really, really excited is I'm excited to see high value work getting done through freelance, meaning it's not just working with one freelancer, it's freelance teams in ways that we don't even know it's freelance. And so I think that's where we're really, really going to make waves when it comes to the next five to 10 years is that this model, it's better, it's faster, it's more cost efficient, there's no doubt. It's forming deeper relationships. People who have freelance know that it's giving them more opportunity than they had in a full-time role. And it's also giving them control over their work. And I just can't wait to see this economy or this, this, this type of work grow. So number one, stop saying gig. Then let's find a way Let's use a different word for freelance. And then after we're done doing that, let's figure out how to make sure high, high value work is really getting done in a, in a better, faster, and more cost-efficient way. Yeah, I love it, man. That sounds good. Thanks for listening. You can always connect with us at skiplist.com.